All right, today on Lulz, Brick and I are going to cover a ton of different topics. Uh, the IP rights to DFS projections, how does that work? We'll touch base on some of the Tom Dwan stuff we briefly touched on last week. There's been some updates with that as he's done a few interviews. Also, my new best ball video is out, which is essentially a response to Brick and Davis's podcast where Brick talked about scrolling down being the new meta. We'll expand on that. And we also have a tease of a new tool Brian is going to be releasing shortly for all of you best ball players out there. It's Lulz. Let's get to it. I, does he think? I think he thinks this. He thinks this is a go. Vegas Dave thinks this is a go. Hot naked girls doing yoga. What? Why don't you just win like a man? Random.org. <laughs> Type in one for yes, two for no, and let the DFS guys pick for you. And I'm absolutely begging you not to do bus. <laughs> Please don't do bus. All right, Brian, uh, before we even talk anything, I'm, I'm trying to up my game on moving these pint glasses, right? Because last week we had Nerdy Tenor buy one, and now today I said, you know what? I'm bringing my Lulz pint glass down here. You can see the ice cubes. And I, you know, normally on my breakfast, they get a little coffee pour. They're going to get an afternoon seltzer pour that I'm going to drink out of this sturdy, incredibly – uh, American sourced uh, pint glass here that everyone needs to buy from the store. You should have. I have my coffee mug lulls in the other room. You should have told me this bit was happening. I'm going to match you. On, yeah. I could have poured my propel in a coffee in a coffee mm-hmm. mug. Oh man, seltzer just tastes better coming out of a lulls mug. All <laughs> the toxicity has been removed. Zero calories, zero toxicity. Seltzer out of a lulls. Guaranteed mug. to dupe less. <laughs> There it is. I need to hire you to do my copy on the, uh, the merch <laughs> descriptions. Um, yeah, lots of lots to get into today. I feel like we could start with what just started to break on Twitter a little bit. Tom Kennedy over at Stochastic. Um, I'll pull up his tweet here. Um, but basically, um, kind of confirming something we've talked about on the show before that people are, you know, quote unquote, stealing projections and then either repurposing them aggregating them, um, calling them their own. And this is kind of an interesting gray area within the DFS space because we've talked about pros aggregating projections for a long time. Of course, that's for personal use and not trying to sell them as their own. As I get this tweet pulled up, do you have any thoughts on sites and what do they actually own when it comes to their numbers and projections? I do, yeah. And uh, before we continue, though, this show is entertainment purposes only. We are purely speculating, so don't sue us or dupe us. Um, uh, I, I mean, I think I said two, three years ago, my guess is a lot of the smaller sites were just aggregating the bigger sites' data and maybe putting like a little RAND, you know, an equals RAND and Excel to make it a little bit different right. uh, at the end of the aggregation. Um and the smart ones you'd think would be like, oh, I think this one guy's off, you know, and then change a few of them. But that right. was kind of always my my guess. Um, and it looks like Stochastic's kind of sick of it. Yeah, I can read this tweet quickly here from Tom Kennedy at TomJK321 on X. I recently became aware of certain sites that are violating our intellectual property rights and want to address this so our position is clear to everyone. Accurate projections data is what we're known for, and it's at the core of what we do. We've invested a massive amount of resources into our models and simulations to get them to that point. It's frustrating to see our work repurposed without permission as industry aggregates, in quotes there, which undermines the effort we put in and violates intellectual property rights. We're not keen on litigation, which is why I'm a recovering attorney, but we fully committed to protecting our work and investment. We'll be reaching out to certain sites individually to address our concerns directly. But if anyone else thinks it is okay to take our data and repackage it as your own product, we hope this prompts a reconsideration of practices where fair play and respect our standard. And then I also saw in the replies, Tom offered uh, a $100 bounty to anyone who can show him other people or, or sites who are using their data this way. Hmm. Yeah, this this seems to me like a precursor to a uh, sound l- lawsuit, right? Like I warned you publicly, I warned you privately, et cetera. How, I guess my initial question, I guess th- there's two parts. There is the part of, you know, do you own numbers? If your projections are, say you're pulling from 
uh, I don't know, an odd screener or a sports book's numbers that inform your projections is, is that fair play in a way, aren't you aggregating and massaging other market data when you create projections? Hmm. It's not used for the same purpose though. You're not comp direct competitors. I yeah. see what you're saying though. Yeah. Like if the line is minus 125 at, in a, at 30, you just put 30 point seven five right and if you didn't come up with that you know DraftKings came up with it i mean in DraftKings rips off you know pinnacle and so like there's a whole bunch of copying going on going on down the line uh i can't you know chance zeros in the chat what what is that what does that mean because he owns his own um sim site what does that does that mean like uh you don't buy it or are they claiming that you guys are copying them or what what, what does that mean Please, please translate this for yes. us. Um, yeah, we don't speak binary. What? And then I guess the second part where my my head goes with this stuff is how would you possibly enforce this outside of you could block a subscription? Um, maybe you're able to kind of track IP address and know, hey, it's this individual, so we're going to make sure they don't have a sub to our site. But how? Even if someone presented you a set of aggregated data, Brian, like almost as just like a data. Uh, thought experiment. Would you be able to suss out if your projections were part of the final aggregated number? Depends on how big of a donkey they are. <laughs> if, if they're a big donkey, all you'd have to do is just put a clear, couple clear miss projections or ownership, mispriced mm. or misvalued, projected, and then they'll just copy and paste directly for the most part. And so like even small changes won't, won't be able to hide it, you know, like whatever today's the players started the players uh, for the PGA. You just put, I don't know, you know, Brendan Todd at 40% own, which is, you know, never going to happen, but if they're a complete donkey, they just copy and paste it in there. Right. I would think that'd be evidence, but like as Tom would know better than we, we do. I bet convincing a judge in like the legality of all that and then the cost of having to go through all that litigation just to be like, just to make a case that, you know, what percentage of judges are going to understand this, this industry and the nuance in it, like <laughs> going to be rough, which is probably why he's playing this, this public game. It's just cheaper to just, you know, even though you want to punish people from stealing your, your content, just like maybe shame them and they'll stop doing it. Yeah. And it's almost similar to um, like another example would be like gated, gated content. Um, let's separate it from projections. Um, you know, it, like something that happens in the space, right? Like I have seen, you know, private unlisted links from ETR premium shows that are just, they're not actually gated by anything other than the link is only shared with people behind a gate, but then that link can be shared outside of the gate. Like that kind of stuff happens a lot. I see though their links to their Friday show being shared in certain spots. I'm sure that they don't like that. How you would ever actually stop that from happening without overhauling your tech and how you distribute that stuff, I don't know. But I guess like in general, this practice of, you know, premium information becoming non-premium is pretty widespread. And then on top of that, like part of the, the services that are being provided, it's almost, I'm not saying begging for this to happen, but you're providing CSVs, you're providing downloads. You're basically saying, here's our data, go do with it what you will. Like it is really easy to take a provided data set and then go manipulate it however you see fit. I'm not saying it's right, right to then right. repurpose it for your own, but I'm just saying like, it is very easy to do so. I, you know, yeah, I think you're, you're uh, making me, you're convincing me. I'm, I'm thinking like this might fall and, and, you know, what do I know? I'm not a judge or a lawyer, but it probably falls under the morally wrong, but legally probably nothing you can, not much you could do about it. Like, cause like, even if you put under your terms and services, like you should, you can use this, but you can't publicly, you know, resell it or repackage it or something. Um, like, like if you catch a user doing that, really probably the only thing you could do is ban them. You know, right. you, I doubt you really have much. I, I, I mean, maybe, maybe not. And then especially if they do any manipulation at all, like I said, I bet some 
over the years, some of these guys were just straight up donkeys and cutting, cutting and pasting, right? Um, to save, you know, just doing no work at all. But like, if you do, you know, I mean, a ju- I mean, I don't know. To me, it just seems like you're kicking the guy out of your bar, you know, or whatever your private, your business. Like that's that's your recourse, and you're going to be wasting a lot of money. I mean, he is a lawyer though. Maybe he can fill out all the paperwork. I don't know. What do you, as far as like, again, thinking about it through a different angle of just the juice being worth the squeeze, like how much time and effort is it worth it to police this stuff? Say a major competitor, I won't even say a site's name, but just enter a really big DFS site was part of this. That's an issue, right? Because they are a direct competitor for you. What if it is someone who has 50 uh, DFS subs, 100 subs, 150 you know, are they actually stealing market share from you? And then is it actually worth going after it on principle alone? It ha- it has to be a, a big site, I would I would guess, where you could get your legal fees paid for plus yeah. restitution in a site that has 50 subs. You're not getting they could just fold. <laughs> you just right. they could just fold if it got if it ever got to that point. Um so yeah, I doubt I doubt it's I doubt it's my, my guess is it's more than one site. Yeah. And I, some people in the Lulz channel, I'd actually never heard, uh, by the way, if you guys want to join us in the deposit kingdom discord, we have a Lulz, uh, channel where you can talk about stuff on the show and uh, Cubs fan shared a screenshot to a site I had never heard of called true DFS membership. Their tagline is true. DFS is the only site combining all projections from leading sources across the industry aggregated in one place, which is like a brazen way to tell on yourself. Oops. (laughs) Oops. <laughs> um, wow. Who do we know true DFS? I had not heard of them until I saw them posted in this uh this account. I've heard of them. I can't, I can't remember who owns them though. Wait. Oh, wait. yeah, that that's our that's our guy. That's our guy? <laughs> what? No. No, sorry, what's his name again? Um E Habs uh, is or M B Habs is his screen name. Owns- yeah. Um, yeah. She uh, sheets sheets. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's, no, been doing, mean, he's been doing well too. That's, that's crazy. That's crazy. I I thought we had enough to unpack with the, the state King stuff last time. And we weren't even, uh, are we, the real good stuff. Are we promoting IP theft? Pete? Uh, good God. I'm going to get it off the screen. Um, yeah. So I let's, let's not get too, uh, too sidetracked here. Uh, but I I just don't know how you go about, even if you know for a fact that this site is using your projection set as a, as a data point and their aggregated projections, and then they're selling that. I mean, other than your, you have to do a phishing operations, like you said, right. And you catch them multiple times with the dummy thing. And then what you build up a kind of a war chest of proof and then go and say, this has been occurring multiple times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you could like you can get tricky with it like yeah. This is the average of ETR, you know, in ours for sure. Like here's ETRs that day, here's ours and here's their projection and we yeah. purposely moved up Siwoo Kim 30 percentage points just to for a few hours. The problem with that doing that too another uh, like a side of it's like like we're paying customers for their projections. Like you can only like release shitty projections for so long. Yeah before you're screwing over your own subscribers. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. Well, what about this? So the chat is, is mentioning something. And I think I would like to make a distinction between projections versus ownership projections. Um, But maybe that distinction shouldn't be made because it is pretty well-known practice that lots of sites, um, I would say, wouldn't you say to have really good ownership projections you would want to be including some kind of market aggregate as part of yours. Sure. Yeah. But they don't have to. Yeah. I, I think what, I think what some of these guys do is they go and then they look at ETRs and then see if there's any big discrepancies and then probably manually adjust. Right. Or which is also, which is also a funny thing just in practice where there with ownership projections, there's the snake eating its own tail dynamic where everyone's trying to aggregate toward a universal ownership projected ownership that that then wills that ownership into existence because everyone is playing off of that same thing where it actually would be more valuable 
if you were in the weeds making your own ownership projections, as you always say with any set of projections, right? If you can make unique projections that are good, that's the best possible thing. Yeah, yeah. I um, I think the pro the projection projections, not the ownership, the stat projections. Um, they are they're make they're they're like they're making that from the bottom up because it's really especially in the NBA. The NBA is kind of really the the the, the important one, probably the easiest one to catch someone else doing because it's just like last minute news, right? And so, like, if you're cheating or if you're copying other people's stuff, and it's so fast, you don't have time to to put in some some changes to make it look like you're not directly copying. Yeah. Um. And and like, you really do need kind of like a bottom up a bottom up approach. I mean, I guess usually there's enough time where you could just copy somebody's and then make a few changes. Um. But man, they're in a rock and hard place. Yeah, it's hard to prove. Probably not enough money to get get back. Uh, it's not much you could do. And I mean, this again, this stuff plays out in lots of different industries. I mean, the music industry is certainly one, you know, where they're like, hey, this riff was in was in my song, and then you used it for yours. And then if it falls under, you know, the realm of it being remixed in a way, or there are tweaks, then it's it's fair game with that. So I, it would be really interesting to see like what precedent could actually get set in, in a case involving this stuff, as far as what is unique, what do you own and what, once it's been remixed is now not yours, essentially. I, I wonder if they could block people, you know, like just try to figure out whose emails associated with it. And just 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 start blocking people. Make it just make it different. Make them sign up again. You know. And what I know you can't do this when you're a big site and you have tons of paying subs and there's so much money um, being had. But it would be really fun to do the nuclear experiment, which is, oops, we didn't post our projections today, and then go to that site and see if theirs are coming. Right. That yeah, would be yeah. the fun one. <laughs> right. But you would have uh, an army of subs with pitchforks. Yeah. Well, you could put the CSV in your Discord. Yeah. And then the users can download it there. But you're going to still piss off a lot of people who aren't in your Discord. It's yeah. too hard. You know, what the, you know what the like adult outcome, I think, would be? Is the sites that are copying them, just charge them a site fee. You know, like instead of whatever it is for a user, you know, yeah. double it or triple it. You know, like. Just give well, us five hundred like bucks a month, and you could use our data. You know, whatever, whatever. I don't know what a fair price is. I'm just making up numbers, but something like that. That is a really. It's almost like what PFF does with their data, right? They have huge licensing deals with NFL organizations where they charge them ungodly amounts of money for that, and then they have the pared down version that fantasy analysts could buy, um, and like different tiers of it, because no fantasy analyst is spending twenty five thousand dollars a year to license all of their data to run an organization slash fantasy site. Like, so that would be an interesting model of just saying, hey, we know this is happening. Let's actually make it worth your while. You pay us this. We'll set you up an even cleaner API to port our projections over to you. And we all win here. We get paid extra and it's actually easier. And we bring it out from the veil of secrecy. Yeah. Yeah. And you make it a price where it's it's makes more sense for them to do that than to steal it and 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 like fight a lawsuit or something or yeah. Yeah. So like that's probably hopefully where where that goes but actually no i hope i hope it goes into a big uh controversial twitter war and we can talk about it more <laughs> people start you know threatening bo boxing max matches head-to-head -head challenges i hope that's where it goes for content yeah and i guess i guess the the issue and why it is obviously so slimy right because you think about and i understand why stochastic is pissed right because when you look around the industry, certain sites bring different value adds and good sites do all of those things well. They have really good projections. They have entertaining personalities. They have great content, good tools. That's obviously like the gold standard or whatever, but everyone has different skill sets. Sites have different skill sets, things they do better. I don't think anyone would argue that stochastic strongest skill set is how good their projections are. So if that's what, you know, butters your bread, uh, you know, you're going to want to protect that as much as possible. Whereas it's like, oh, you make this incredible content. This show is so valuable. It's like, okay, you can try to knock 
off our show format, but if you don't have our intelligence or our entertainment value, then like you're not even going to be able to replicate that, but you can actually take someone's numbers. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the most likely outcome here is they're just going to continue to take them. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Beach had, uh, I can't tell if he's joking. I'm assuming that's probably a joke. Um, But could you imagine, you know, the department of DFS projections and ownership, (laughs) how incompetent, Oh yeah, it would be if they regulated and taxed it. Yeah, Chan Zero says there's easier ways to fingerprint each individual files for each user. You can make unique copies for each projection file with a unique fingerprint. It's what big companies do to catch moles with emails, docs. But uh, Doubt Stochastic and other sites have the resources or ability to do that. Um, yeah, that would probably be a pretty expensive overhaul to how you kind of disseminate your data. Yeah, if they had like an AP, API or something, they could probably probably do it that way who, who knows yeah who knows i'm sure they're they're thinking about a bunch of different ways and i i think too here's another and hopefully m- more of these sites actually get outed because it would be really interesting to know where it really really gets slimy right is if they are talking about their you know award winning or industry winning projections like if they are actually trying to sell that sub because of the projections or is that just something like hey having projections for a dfs site is just table stakes for getting subs and i'm just doing content and write-ups and and videos and to get people in the door i also need to offer this and so i'm just going to like tack that on or are you actually trying to sell it as your own yeah i mean honestly though i think if this got in front of a judge and you said no i aggregate multiple sites I could see like 50, 50 or even higher than the judge going, well, this isn't yours. This isn't a direct copy of yours. He's doing something else. Right. I could easily see that. Yeah. And then even then, so like in the initial experiment we were talking about, right, where you throw them off with a fake number or whatever, then the judge is looking at two numbers that aren't even identical. It's just one's weighted closer to the other than the others. You know, that it's like, then how the fuck do you prove that? I, but I'm, I'm even saying they admit it. You know, right. these, oh. these sites that are getting sued admit we are aggregating in the judge, even then would be 50, 50 or greater. I, I'm again, I have no clue just speculating, but I could easily see them going, no, that's aggregating. It's, it's a different number. Like, sorry, it's not yours anymore. I could yeah. easily see a judge just going case dismissed. And then you just spent, you know, 50 legal hours or whatever, getting to that point. Yep. Um, all right. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a little bit more fallout on this since this just kind of broke on Twitter and people are discussing it. And maybe we'll actually um, hear more about Stochastic's kind of public um, mission to try to, I don't know, eradicate some of this stuff. Uh, I did want to touch on Tom Dwan, Brian, because we were talking about that last week. We actually reached out to Peter Jetton, one of the guys uh, accusing Tom of owing him large sums of money. He didn't respond to my DM, uh, but since all of this unfolded, Tom Dwan has given, I believe, multiple interviews. I listened to the interview he gave on Poker News, and I was enraged listening to that podcast. It was frustrating. I listened to it as well after you told me. What a bunch of uh, bullshit. Yeah, and again, for people who don't know, there's multiple people in the poker world, high-profile guys, Jungle Man, Haralabob, this guy Peter Jetton, who used to be his friend. Um, All of their relationships with Dwan, I think, are slightly different. You know, Dwan had the heads-up challenge with Jungle Man. That was a different thing. Jetton was part of, like, a staking deal. Um, The Haralabob was when Dwan was bearding for him. So all of them are a little different, but there's a clear pattern of him owing these guys money. And what was so frustrating listening to that podcast, it was like he never said it wasn't true that he owed them money. He just basically said, I didn't like how they were handling it. And once they were being a jerk, I didn't actually feel like I owed them that much money. Was that not the essence of every one of his arguments? That was exactly the essence. But you just coherently stated what would take him 15 minutes (laughs) of blabbering and and stuttering and going, you know, you know what I mean? You know, you know, you know, like after, like, oh, well, you know, there's this thing about, you know how it goes, you know, and then like, well, should we should like, it didn't even make like a lot of the ones didn't even make sense. It, it, and I was the whole time I was thinking like, why did he agree to do this? 
if this was going to be how he handles it, like it made me the, like just think like the ego on this guy to think he was going to like PR handle this. And this is how it went was like, like e- either that or he's dumb, but he's unlikely that he's dumb. Right. It's unlikely he's done. He just thought I could go on here and, you know, I'll, I, I could tell him what the way I, my side of the story and it'll clear all this up. Yeah, and he was doing he with Haralabob and Jungle Man. He almost played it out as like, oh, you know, I've had some, you know, a phone call with Haralabob, and we were joking around, and you know, Jungle Man, me and him, we're kind of simpatico. We both know that we're tough to deal with, and it's all fun and games. And it's like, but they're publicly accusing you of owing a shit ton of money. Is, is like this just some performative art piece where you guys are just like having it out in front of people on X for fun? It's like, no, they actually seem like they would like to get paid what you owe them. And you're like, oh, don't worry. We're, we kind of have an understanding of where we're at with stuff. And he knows he was a dick. So it's kind of cool that I haven't paid yet. He, he, that it was totally in there and weird. But the, then the Haralabob thing, that tweet he sent about – like insinuating Bob was betting while he was working for the Mavs. Yeah, I should pull that up. Is like way beyond cool. Right. To tweet that out. And like, like especially if what Bob's saying is true, which I, I assume most parties involved agree. I think even Tom agrees. You owe him 350 grand. You're not paying him. You get mad that he publicly comes out and then you – and then you drop a nuke like this. Yeah, this was the tweet that came out. It must have been like the day after our show last week. He he publicly tags Haralabob but puts the period in front so everyone can see it. Uh, Tom knows Twitter. Uh, Haralabob, how much action did you have on basketball while under contract with the Mavs? I wonder what contract and legal spots that could bring up. Does the same kind of stuff happen with your soccer team? Haralabob, obviously, on to... Uh, uh, a Spanish soccer league where he's working now. I mean, that is, that's a low blow from going, you owe me money to, to, to going to this extent. Right. This, I mean, this is like jail time. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah. And I, and I did. It shouldn't be by the way, but that's neither here nor there. I think Haralabob had a tweet that someone grabbed the screenshot before he deleted it, but saying something about uh, a libel suit that he would maybe uh, look into for something uh, like this. <laughs> the guy owes you 350 grand. You're going to try to get more out of him from a libel suit. Good luck. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, and this is, again, what is this a technique when you owe someone? This is it's not the dictionary definition of deflection. It's like, oh, let's shine something over here again in a not address that you owe this person money. We speculated, and again, this is all speculation, but we speculated last week that he must have some gambling problems, which is what's yeah. in all this. But like, maybe he's got, maybe he's got other issues going on too, just from the way he handled all this so poorly, like, like, like really, it really a uh, smooth brain, uh, you know, decision-making, Going overboard on this. Uh, same thing with the Jetton. Going and publicly doing interviews where he looks guilty as hell. He's got no like um, no arguments that are coherent. If that you know that's even being generous, they they I think they made him look more guilty every step of the way. It seems like who is advising this guy, and he did eventually you know, spoiler alert with Jetton, agree to arbitration maybe six hours after that interview, which makes yeah. me think, Pete, that somebody called him and knocked some sense into him. Yeah. Also, I meant to, not to get distracted, but I guess this is part of it. Do, do you have any idea what this could have implied? Tom had a tweet saying, nice to have my Twitter back, LOL. Like, he was implying that he couldn't talk about this stuff that he didn't have access to his Twitter account. I didn't know what that would have meant. Yeah. I, I took it as like, he forgot his password and didn't have his Twitter for the last year. Cause like, if you see like the tweet before the, this whole thing was like a year old, year old or yeah. something before all this. I mean, I, obviously maybe you're right. I, I really have no idea. Yeah. So like September was his last, last tweet. And I thought it was like, after he, he drops that nuke on, on Bob, that 
it was also like saying, nice to have my Twitter back. I just fucking blew up the internet, you know, that kind of thing. Even the way he writes, like this is a the tweet. So, you know, Peter, let's go to arbitration and find out. Um, or you could just pay the remaining and be done with it. Tom says, offer still stands. Why not our oldest mutual friend to arbitrate it? And then he goes, this this sentence is wild. Would have arbitrated with just about anyone reasonable before you publicly lied so much and you know that. Which implies that he now wants to have it arbitrated by someone not reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 right. By anyone right. reasonable. No longer. Now I need an unreasonable well, arbitrator. It, it also implies, I mean, he, he all of this stuff in the interviews and this imply he owes them. Yes. Like, he's, he's saying he owes them. He just doesn't like the way they handle it. So I'm not going to pay you because I don't like what you what you said. It, it it is a different world, the high stakes loaning and and stuff like that. So there is, you know, there is there there is like unspoken rules and all sorts of stuff like that. But like it, clearly, and and he did the the interview like this too. Like I didn't even underneath see it, his nose. No it was so annoying. This is the first I've seen it. I just saw. I just listened to the audio. This is ridiculous. oh, I yeah, I watched the visual. And I tweeted this out though, and and, and you know, side note with Tom Dwan, he doesn't look a day older than when he first came on the scene in 2007 or whatever, 2006. A high stakes. He looks a little I, more strung looks, out though. He looks a little older, but he looks pretty good. I mean, he looks very similar. There you go, Brian. Brian's. Uh, how do you prevent aging? It's not uh, an elaborate skin routine. It's owing lots of people billions of dollars. Uh, <laughs> Um, and he still owes Jungle Man. Yeah. Wait, we got Andy in the chat. D Dwan replies to your tweets, Andy. I love this. I didn't know Dwan followed you on Twitter. Um, there you go. Um, congrats on the engagement. Um, but yeah, now he's been tweeting up a storm. Um, yeah, it's 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 inter It's also telling to be like. Like, who's the reliable narrator? Has there been anyone coming forward in Dwan's camp of being like, this is a reputable guy. I've had dealings with him. Like, guys like Bill Perkins, who, for all I know, has an, a great reputation in the poker space, has, like, free-rolled lots of people on, on big bets, always seems to pay up, all of that stuff. Like, no one seems to be caping up for him here. That, this text exchange is weird, too. Bill Perkins, exactly zero. He'd bet you on that. No way he wouldn't. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't bet him on that because Tom will never pay. I'm assuming. Is that what exactly. he's saying? Exactly. Yeah. And then <laughs> Tom's on Annie up, buddy. It's like you owe all these people. What do you mean, Annie up? You're the first pay your debts, and then you can play the. Yeah. Then you can maybe play a game with with an ante. Um, and then he does this thing. Can you text me like a normal person? I actually still think I like you, though. Even. Well, and this was a popular refrain on the show. He's like. You know, why do these guys all go to Twitter? Why don't they just hit me up? Like, I'm totally cool and reasonable if you just hit me up over text. Like, we're buddies and we can kind of settle this, you know? And it's like, it seems like that didn't work for them and that they've escalated this to the court of public opinion. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, four years later, whatever. It just makes me think he's got something wrong with him. Yeah. And I, I, he's, let, like, let's let's be honest. If you were to power rank you know, sites within the poker world um, as far as, you know, what it means reputation wise and to get the deals like, you know, what, what, what are the, like, what's Negreanu sponsored with right now? Is it like, he is was it GG global? poker. I don't know anymore. Yeah. Um, but I mean, he's clearly um, getting needing funds for the, the sponsorship, right? Because like, He's been pretty he he did a deal I believe with that Triton which was the high stakes poker abroad series I know he had like a marketing deal with them back in the day because a lot of their games were based in Macau and stuff um but then going to ACR it seems out of character for his like what he does as a player he's a high stakes guy he's not grinding you know ACR cash games right like even giving the interview it was like I'm going to bring all these you know, cool ideas to ACR, like a progressive squid tournament, whatever that means. Um, like it just, it didn't add up as far as like part of his brand or whatever. That's true. I didn't think of it that. Cause I was thinking 
do you want to be an ACR pro right now? They have a lot of like bot issues and allegations and, you know, an unregulated, I can't believe I'm saying unregulated, but an unregulated poker, poker site specifically in this world. Like, I don't know if I'd even play it much less want to be a, be a sponsor. Right. Exactly. That, and that's what I meant as far as a a safe site to be associated with where you are going to catch some heat um, for things that happen on that. Right. But you, you also said, which makes sense too, like that probably means he needs the money then. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. But then, but then it was like, okay, you know, does everyone, what people were making jokes in his ACR announcement, just have ACR directly play for all of (laughs) juggle van instead of the direct deposit (laughs) and they'll take care of it. Right. But it's also like, it is weird if you're going to do what's a clear cash grab. And if it was aside from this debt stuff, it's like, whatever, go get your bag, however you want. But it is weird to be like, all right, you know, some nice checks are starting to come in and there's still lots of people out here who you owe money. Right. right. Yeah. And obviously we're not shaming. I think the sponsorship deals are cool. Honestly, I think yeah. they're like, yeah, I think it's like an honor kind of, you know, yeah. right. There you go. Okay. There you go. So like, yeah, I'm definitely, I, I mean, and I wish the, uh, the DFS, uh, sites would try to make t- the Tom Duans of the world, you know, pump mm. them up, make them, you know, make them seem like it's something, uh, that, that someone can achieve, you know, cause it clearly it is. And it's, and it's, you know, we, we've talked about this ad nauseum on the show, you know, have competitions between these guys. So, yeah, we're all for it. But like, um, but that would be hilarious if they just directly paid, directly paid him. I heard another one, though, besides this sponsorship deal was like he won a million dollar pot. I think Bob t- tweeted about it. He won like a oh, million dollar yeah. pot in front of him and still wouldn't pay him. <laughs> yeah. Man. What are you doing playing a game with a guy who owes you 350 well, I guess I is, guess if you lose lose that money to him, you can go like just give me that directly back right now. And you're never so going to see it anyways. Even my guess is in that example, and who knows? This is just uh, hypothesizing that even if you wanted to give the money you just won, that money is already probably accounted for as part of another staking deal or some kind of. Uh, someone has equity in that to where it's like, it's not actually just my money to slide the chips over to you because someone else has squatter rights uh, on this money too. Because man, if I've learned one thing from listening to some of these interviews, like we were kind of talking about it last week, all of the different exchanging of money and arrangements. I mean, the amount of things that Tom was caught up in with what sounds like very little accounting or at least hard, good accounting is, is wild. I mean, money flying every which way. I can honestly see how there would be some gray areas, but I also think when you're talking about sums of money at that size, that these guys probably know exactly what they're owed. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's another thing with that interview is like, it was kind of alluding to like, there was some other staking going on and he was staking other people and who really owes who, which is a valid argument if true, but he couldn't even like spit it out in a coherent way. Like, there was three other guys who I staked. They were in on this jet and deal. So like, it's not exactly his numbers are not right, which is why I was so upset because I don't owe him nearly that much done, you know, whatever. And so like, I do owe him, but not nearly that much. And I would go to arbitration, but now that he's lying about the number, this guy's not going to, you know, something like that. Like that makes some sense. But if anyone goes and watches that interview, you can see it's like he, he was, he was way overconfident how he was going to handle this. He uses the word spot uh, a lot. Oh my God, a lot. In a in a very, it's almost like this catch-all like scapegoat term yeah. where it can encompass so much where it's like, oh, well, this spot, as if there was so much ambiguity to what a spot meant. And I'm like, right. there have to be some hard numbers behind. You get X amount of dollars in exchange for X percentage of net profit or whatever it is. It's like, why is this spot sound like it's something you're negotiating in real time? That's how we use the word. You could, you, we could have like w- reviewed that interview <laughs> live oh on here, God. but we'd be stopping every 15 seconds and going like, that doesn't make any sense. He's babbling here. Why does he say spot every, every 10 seconds? I, I, I can't remember the last time I got that mad listening to a piece of audio. Maybe it's because I normally listen to entertainment, uh, you know, vehicles, but that drove me crazy. That interview. So was he, was he actually like, like you're, you're kind of one of your idols or no, 
was that all just straight bet? No, that was like, and I wrote about this in my newsletter. It was just how I crossed paths with him. He, I mean, I had watched him when I was really into poker um, back in the day, but the whole things when he started crossing my paths was when Mans was spoof hunting him down. Um, I wasn't like a fanboy or anything, okay. but I uh, I started making videos about him because the site I was working with, PokerTube, was like, dude, anything involving Tom Dwan in poker just gets insane amount of clicks because he's this super fun player, and now on top of it, there's all this mystery surrounding him. He's been kind of off the beaten path. He's hiding out in Macau. There's like, you can go read, if you search Tom Dwan triads, Tom Dwan, like mafia, you can find all these crazy conspiracy theories. And so I just started making those videos. And then in the, in the newsletter, I explained uh, how I uh, ended up crossing paths with him. Um, but yeah. Cause you, you, you're, you're, uh, your age range. I could see you're maybe a little too old, but like where I could see, uh, like that Tom Dwan would be like your poker guy, you know? Uh, so probably yeah. more like, it's probably more like Davis's age range. I think. Well, yeah, because if you think about, we, we talk about this all the time, right? With personalities and it's actually interesting though, right? Because he's not like an Antonio S. Fandiari where he's this really interesting personality, both how he plays and his verbal game at the table, you know, not some like, you know, Phil Locke or these other guys who kind of came up with these huge personalities. He, his reputation was entirely carried based on his style of play because you listen to him talk. It's not like he's some charismatic speaker or engaging. It's just that he was an action player, which is honestly impressive to get that level of celebrity exclusively to what you do on the felt. I, I, I agree with you, action player, but also at that point in time, he was more of like a Bobby Fisher too, like True. a young online stud and they'd say like he can learn you know i remember some old articles like he'll learn any game and within a week he's better than everyone else so like people are intrigued by that you know young genius um as well too and he was definitely they played him up on the you know the poker the poker tv shows and like back then you know the there was not nearly as much media and so like and poker was huge huge yeah. back then so like he was definitely the number I would say the number one like media creation yeah from that era well and because he was the guy that kind of because before that it was all the old school guys right it's the Doyle yeah. Brunsons the Howard Letterers the old guard here and he was the first guy to kind of buck that trend partly because he was one of the first guys who was able to get amass a ton of volume online where those other guys all cut their teeth with IRL poker I wonder how much of this has kind of got he got he got too big too fast, was young, did in his head like zero responsibility and like no no reason to grow up or anything like that. And um as far as I know, no kids, no no wife, just traveling the world and you know, like he's not gonna have the I don't know what the word is, like the, if you draft a lot yeah. on underdog I from his craft the reality. Is that is that you playing something? Oh, sorry, I was just getting a screen share. Um, the um, the other thing too is I imagine for someone like him who's playing at the highest of stakes in poker, first on his own, and then when he was probably getting staked and playing in those games in Macau, I mean, those are probably some of the biggest poker games that have ever happened. Those games in Macau, it has to be incredibly hard after you've gotten to chase that high and that adrenaline to basically do anything for any less amount of money. Um, and that's probably been a tough pill to swallow. And then it's like, well, you owe money. Well, how do I win it back? Well, I go play in the world's biggest games. And then anything away from that, your your kind of senses are now like dull to anything else, I would imagine. And the the game might have passed him by. Yeah. Like, like before, he could just go play, you know, 5,100 – on full tilt or poker stars or whatever. Obviously you don't have full tilt. No, I guess he probably lives abroad. Right. And so he probably yeah. could, but then he could just go and make, you know, 500 K really easily pay off some of his debts and the yeah. sponsorship money was flowing and et cetera, et cetera. Who cares if he owes a million dollars to Bob? Like that was probably easy to pay off. And then now I can't beat these game these games like whether he went well, you know would want to admit it or not maybe he can I don't know but uh, I imagine it's it's not so easy to beat high stakes online anymore and, and I bet 
if if he thought he was plus EV against Jungle Man, I bet he'd be willing to finish the challenge. Like you know, there's there's probably a, a reason uh, that he doesn't want to right. finish those challenges either. Right. right. Um. Yeah. All right, let's talk a little best ball today. A uh, couple things going. I just released my video that was uh, a direct result of Brian and Davis on a fake lulls talking about scrolling the F down. And I said, you know what, Brian, that would make an awesome video to explore. So that just dropped today on the Deposit Kingdom YouTube channel. I'll drop that link in the chat. Brian, I know you got a chance to watch it. I was kind of like holding some of my thoughts to the vest just because I wanted to get them out in the video first. But now that they're out there, um, did you have any thoughts on the follow-up? Uh, yeah, I do. But why don't you kind of explain the video or? Yeah. So, you know, Brian had, we've talked a lot about the scrolling the F down and when the badge bros kind of coined that phrase, it resulted or um, was specific to the daily contest where there's just six rounds, uh, 36 players are drafted. You're drafting these teams a day, maybe a couple of days before lock. I mean, potentially hours before lock, if you're drafting on Sunday morning and Brian brought up that this strategy, which has been proven to be successful in the dailies, could not only be applied to our season-long best ball drafts, but could be kind of the meta this year, the thing, the, the strategy that everyone gravitates to before everyone knows about it. And so I kind of wanted to just dig in, look at the differences and similarities between the strategy and the dailies, and then try to handpick what are the elements of it that work in the dailies that could be applied to the season long stuff, because what you found is around pick 165, 170 players in drafts start to be drafted at less than a 100% clip, which therefore can provide edge in selecting players that are not on everyone else's roster. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That sums it up and your video sums it up nicely. And then I, you know, I wanted to take that, that idea um, plus poker tracker, which is old, old school poker uh, heads up display where you, you, you get uh, the data that you uh, from when you played poker hands and then you overlay and you can kind of get a feeling for what your, how your opponents play and then adjust accordingly and kind mm. of apply all that to uh, best ball this year. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's kind of where we're at now where um, you could use this strategy and others to um you know hopefully increase increase your edge i think in the most obvious way that really people haven't talked about and we probably shouldn't have talked about it or <laughs> you know what i mean um the badge the badge rose probably shouldn't have talked about it either but uh now that it's out there might as well make content on it and put it on the app yeah i pulled up one of the graphics here um this was when, you know, Brian pointed me in the direction underdog made the public uh, or underdog made the BBM four data publicly available. So you can go see which percent drafted each player was in the contest. And so I just kind of summarized this into a little graph, roughly hundred percent through 168, 90% 169 to 192, um, which is the equivalent of round 15 through 16, round 17 and 18 down to 65%. And then you really fall a off of, of a cliff there, 26%. And then if you're scrolling all the way down after 250, you're going to be sub 3%. And I think one of my big takeaways and one of the kind of like the fine tuning, the point that I wanted to make was not thinking through scrolling down specifically through the lens of ADP, because that's just a specific point in time, but through the lens of how often has this player been drafted and use kind of the illustration of say Puka Nakua last year, who mostly went undrafted, say he got steamed up two weeks to go before the season started and he was a 14th round pick, you wouldn't want to say, hey, he's a fragile 14th round pick because of this ADP. You'd actually want to say, holy cow, he just started getting drafted. I actually don't even care. Like even if he was a seventh round pick, he would still probably be a very good pick because he ended up closing at 30% ownership. So that was kind of the distinction I wanted to make less scroll down for ADP scroll down for percent drafted. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, you know, the, the main reason I, I was, we were talking about that is because it was just easy. The data was already compiled, by yeah. dog, so, but it's, but it's true that like, you don't know, uh, you know, when somebody is, you know, whatever, um, 
let's say 194th overall pick when you draft them, but how often were they taken through the whole year, which kind of, kind of sucks because you're going to have to guess, you're going to have to know yeah. ball a little bit throughout the, throughout the year to guess which of these guys you, you, um, you're most interested in taking. And I will note that I don't think you mentioned this in the video, but definitely something to pay attention to is there's a big difference based on position. Yes. So tight ends and QBs in these later rounds are going to be drafted at a much higher frequency. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I you could see it in the – I'm pulling up a few charts here if you guys are watching the video version of this. I pulled this up in the Battle Royale data where you can also see this reflected where in this Battle Royale percent drafted, I have it spliced out by position, and you can see the tight ends and the quarterbacks in the later rounds are drafted at a much higher frequency just because there aren't as many – available options um when you think about it uh like on a given week there might be like 14 or 15 quarterbacks you want to use um whereas there might be 50 60 wide receivers who you could justifiably make a case for so to me that does track that the ownership is going to be naturally boosted and when i did the team that i uh had in battle royale uh, if i can find that here that was the case nico collins and tank dell both had super late adps but Tank was 5% and uh, Dalton Schultz with 30% because just naturally there was only like, you know, 10 tight ends people were selecting that week. So the eighth tight end, even though he's out of the 36 that normally get drafted, people are still completing stacks with him, just clicking him more just because of the available options. Yep, definitely. Q and QB is obvious, right? Because there's, yeah. there's 30 QBs and there's only you're only competing against 12 teams. So you could just yeah. wait for your second or third QB till the last round and get Jared Goff or who, who knows, depending on the year. So someone who's definitely going to start. Yeah. Right? And, and tight and yeah. Tight end stack completion is huge. But anyways, the point being, even those guys you could see are still not drafted um, as frequently in that rounds 35, 36. And you mentioned this in the video. This is the, this is the clearest reason to do it. The point projection is so close that if you think of it like a DFS player, it's ridiculous not to just scroll down a little yeah. bit, take the guy two after, and then no one has him. It's like a no brainer. Yeah. I use this example and it's funny because not this specific week, but there were lots of weeks where this hypothetical wide receiver, wide receiver two example was tank Dell and Nico Collins. Uh, where they were priced very similarly. One had a slightly higher projection, normally Nico, um, and Nico would be like 35% and Tank would be, you know, six or seven. And even a gap of 20%, DFS bros were like, dude, you can't play Nico at 35. You have to play Tank. And DFS bros understand that. And then it's like, well, what if you could go to underdog and the gap in percentage was 95% yeah. instead of 20%. It's 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 crazy. Uh, which you know what this leads to is if you speaking of copying people's projections, if you can get good season long projections, those are hard. Those are really hard to make. Yeah. That would be a good spot to then do this comparison and go whatever, you know, Nico Collins is projected for, I don't know, what's a realistic number, tw uh, 200 points or something. And then, and then uh, Tank Dell's not this year, obviously, but the year before. Tank Dell's projected for 125, you know, even though that might be significantly different. Um, if one guy's getting drafted 20% of the time, yeah, that's a, that's a huge difference. So getting either knowing ball or getting good projections for the season long is going to be uh, like really important to this, to this strategy, because it's a lot, you have so much more information at 11 o'clock on a Sunday a week four than you do in April, you know, of the preseason. Yeah. Yep. And I, I hit on that in the video and I think it, I was at this, I couldn't get this in the weeds on it, but another mm -hmm. point to that, I think goes back to the positional differences. One thing I noticed last year that I don't necessarily regret from a scroll down um, factor was the running backs. It's, it's easier to project or understand kind of like the binary nature of their value. Like 
if you're a running back two versus a running back three, like it's such a massive difference. And so like I was selecting guys like Chuba Hubbard and Devin Singletary in a ton of drafts in that fragile territory this year, but it was because of that information edge of like knowing these guys were the number two to a certain degree of confidence, obviously not 100%. Right. Whereas I think if you go to pass catchers, that's where you can really find some crazy bands where it's like, use the example of like Jamison Williams, who would be like going in the 10th. And then like, so he's the wide receiver three or the third on the target order. And then a Josh Reynolds or a Khalif Raymond. And those guys aren't even getting drafted whatsoever. And I think there's probably a little bit more fragility in projections when you're going down the depth chart at wide receiver than there is at running back where it's like, Hey, if you're next man up like that, knowing that you could be next man up is worth so much versus if you're RB three, like you essentially have no value, no matter what happens. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is also like, I think, I think, although this seems to be my answer all the time is leads to a more balanced portfolio. And, yes. and even though you do should have no ball takes or good projections, don't overdo it. Don't go, you know, 80% tank Dell, you know, in this, you know, scenario where we don't not new tank Dell, but when you don't have that yeah. information um, and like, you have to be okay with taking a bagel yeah. uh, with this strategy, which sucks. We said this in that podcast too, though, like you're probably going to lose anyway. So scroll the F down, you know, was our saying in the, in that, in that podcast. Um, and that's kind of what, what that means is like, you know, you're probably going to lose. So like, don't be afraid of taking a bagel um, yeah. in weeks in, you know, in round 17 or round 16 or something like that. And, and I think too, and the other kind of point I make at the end of the video of like how I really want to execute this is, and I almost think about it as a sliding scale of you want to ramp up your scrolling the F down, the closer we get to the season locking. So it's like right now, you know, there's so much uncertainty. You could be scrolling down, taking guys who are just stone zeros. But as we get there, you not only have more information about the depth charts, you know, like, Hey, Kyron Williams is now the running back to there, but you also know how long they've been on the drafting radar. And you're like, Holy cow. Like I've been in 145 of these drafts this summer. And most of the time Kyron Williams doesn't get drafted. Boom. My last five drafts, I'm slamming Kyron Williams in every single one. I don't even care if it's in the 14th round. Because one, those picks aren't worth that much anyways. And two, he's barely been drafted. And that's my edge is getting this guy. And so I'm going to push all my chips in closer to when the season starts, as opposed to if you do that now, Kyron Williams pops on the radar and it's like, okay, well, now you just have an overweight exposure to a guy everyone else is drafting too. When you said that in that video, my initial reaction was dis was to disagree with it. Now I think you're right. Yeah, you sold me there where you, you, you don't know what, percentage these guys are going to be drafted right now so like if you take some you know some guy who's adp is right on right on the number right now he still might be drafted you know 20 percent of the time by the year's end but i think hopefully we uh, i mean i i asked rodman this and they might release every month the data of the drafts that happened Ooh, before. that so would if cool. right if they do do that you could kind of more and more narrow down your scroll the F down players, but yeah. that should be, you know, like Pat's site and stuff like that. That probably should be part of their package now, like this week or this month, here's our 10 scroll the down boys. Yeah. In, in people in the chat, I was actually, when I was working on this video, I was talking to Zach religious and what Paul and Nick are talking about in the chat. I was thinking about this as well. Is anyone tracking ADP over time to estimate percentage drafted to date? And then Nick says, feel not so hard to pull each week, pull the current fill and build an ownership estimate off that. Where it is some equation of, we know what the, the ADP equates to as far as times drafted. And then you have some time element that's reflective of how much the contest has been filled. And someone smarter than me with a math equation could probably bake that out and take weekly updates and then spit out a percentage drafted estimation for the entire contest. Yeah. You could do that pretty easily. One, one, one issue there would be like when Cooper cup gets hurt, that's clearly going to bias the data for Puka Nakua after that and stuff like that. Like, so you, if you could um, adjust for that, you can get that more, more accurate, accurate. 
Um, but is if they're releasing the data every month, like you don't even need to do anything. Like you just go and look at the data, you know, they'll be right on their site and be like, Dalton Schultz is drafted 85% of the time right now. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. That's all I need. And you know, I mean, like you, you don't, you know, yeah. don't even need a formula, you know, like nope. more than that. And, and again, it does go back um, to, if you're drafting continuously throughout the summer, you're going to have a pretty good feel for this stuff. Um, for, right. for who's getting regularly selected. And you notice things. You're like, oh, he's getting drafted here now. <laughs> I don't remember him routinely being it. And there's now tons of people tracking those general week-to-week ADP movements. And so I, my you know, personal takeaway is I had not been practicing this nearly to the extent I should be. And it's going to be front of mind for me this year throughout the draft cycle and progressively. So, and uh, I think we can maybe have some fun too. Like Brian said, you're, you're, you know, scroll the F down targets of the month and trying to kind of get ahead of some of those market movements. Yeah. Uh, I also say that selfishly because then I can use those, but I mean, that's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to get, I'm going to get whoever the, the scroll the F down flavor of the day is put and then put them adjust my rankings and then just not over, overdo it and put too many in into every draft and, 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 and be more balanced. Uh, if you guys uh, would please head over uh, at some point and watch that video on the deposit kingdom channel. If you have any interest in best ball and it's applicable to wherever you're playing. Um, obviously I use underdog data, but these concepts um, pertain to basically any season long best ball format. So uh, please check that out. Subscribe to that channel. I'm going to be doing a lot more weekly videos over there on the deposit kingdom channel. The thought is this is a live stream channel. We're going to keep all of the produced videos there. Spent a lot of time on that. Would love it if you guys check that out. You can leave a comment. Let me know what you think. Um, Brian, I did want to pull up. Can we do a little tease here of something that's going to be coming to the Brick 75 draft caddy? Yeah, let's do it. All right, let me pull this up. Tell people here. Plus, I would mind uh, some feedback. Yeah, what are we looking at here? So, yeah, this should be on the app tomorrow hopefully um i'm just trying to rip off poker tracker i'm gonna blatantly say um don't sue me you're gonna say stochastic yeah don't (laughs) don't. (laughs) yeah someone wrote in chat like he should he should uh aggregate the badge bros uh rankings i'm like i'm just gonna steal the bad bro badge bro rankings and just put it right on there blatantly um but uh uh so don't sue me uh taylor but um, basically, you just you could see right above. Um, uh, I know that's Nicole's account and Valley. You, you yeah, see, like the few like, that's her standard deviation of mm-hmm. her draft. So I don't know what like I don't want to clog I don't want to clog up too much like data up there. So like, I was thinking like maybe one more stat. Uh, Poker Tracker usually puts like a whole bunch of stats on there. Mm-hmm. I thought it'd be better to have just one or two stats. And then you scroll and then you hover over that number and then this table will pop up, which uh, we're still, you know, working on formatting, but it's got all this, all these various data points from that user. And then the average of the top 150, which I'm just saying is, is, you know, a proxy of probably about right for now is these type of numbers. So you could also scroll over your own numbers and see how you compared to the average top 50 or like how you'd want to change your game at all. Yeah. I, um, I think this is, is very cool. A couple of my thoughts, um, you could probably get rid of average build QB RB wide receiver tight end and just accomplish it with preferred build. Um, cause that's going to give you, I assume that's always going to be kind of reflective of what those numbers are. It like is. Four, five, it seven, is. Two. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, I mean, I, I didn't want to um, round all the way up, though, on those builds because it does kind of ma- – because, like, when you it, – it doesn't seem like it's important, but when you look at the difference between, like, your info and then, like, somebody else's, like, you could – even though you, you know, your your average wide receivers is, was probably, like, 7.9, like, you're, you were yeah. closing in on 8, you yeah. know, and somebody else is at 7.2 – that's actually a pretty big dramatic difference, even though it doesn't. Well, that's why I would say if it has the decimal, then it would be valuable. But I think if it's round, then it it wouldn't be. That's that's why I was more. I wanted one, just like the that looks just like your display there. 
Yeah. You know, and then one with the decimals. So like if you really want to get in that nuance and you can't see it from this screenshot, but there'll also be a, um, a value hound ratio. Yeah. Which is any percent of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the ratio of picks of taking someone, you know, uh, in above ADP versus below ADP. So like yeah. if you take someone who is ADP is, you know, whatever, 192 and you take them at 200, you just got eight points of ADP, right? Um, that's like a, that's a value. That's a value pick. And so you could see like even though um, Davis was nitty, right? We are making fun of him for being nitty. His value ratio, value hound ratio was actually low. So he was taking – guys after ADP, even though it was in a tight range of probably three to eight spots a- after their ADP. Yeah. The majority of his picks actually were after ADP. So like you could like, let's say he, let's say you're playing against Davis and then you look at his picks and you want to know if he's going to take this next guy who's at ADP and just sitting there for you. You could, you could not confidently, but you have like a better idea that he might actually pass that guy up, even though, he's a value, a value spot, like an obvious value spot. Like no one's taking him 10 spots. Yeah. If you might, if you're on a turn or something, you could like let Davis take, take, you know, you could, you could plan it out or you could plan out. You could see their builds and go like, this guy loves wide receivers. I can leave this running back for the turn, you know, on and on. Yeah. I think this is cool. I think the, the stuff that would be most interesting to me or helpful is that average first pick. Um, you know, looking at quarterback tight end, those onesies specifically, like, can I push this guy around? Are they just a late round QB bro? Uh, I can, I can let this quarterback come back around another cool tool or a a feature would be if there was a way where they deep, when they deviated from the average, the most, if that was almost like highlighted, like, Holy cow, this is an extreme zero RB bro. Or like, this is an extreme I load up on multiple quarterbacks. Like maybe if there was some kind of like highlighter of like you, because sometimes I think when they're just off of standard deviation, it's not as helpful. It's like, Oh, you're just a normal drafter, but it's actually saying like, no, this is where you really um, take stands relative to the field. Yeah. Okay. There's that total drafts. Isn't nothing either. You know, No, that's very valuable. Yeah. yeah. Like if someone's drafted 27 times like that, yeah, well, they probably, they're probably, you know, paying attention. Yeah. Um, the standard deviation and standard deviation after 167, I think matters quite a bit because there can be a big difference between those two as well, where somebody has like a lower standard deviation early and a high standard deviation late. That means they're probably a scroll the F down guy in yeah. the rounds, which may, you know, might affect how you want to draft in those later rounds and early. And if their standard deviation after 167 is really high and their standard deviation is is low early, well, then this guy's following ADP early. So you can be sure if you're on the turn or something that like whoever's ADP here is going next. So like if I want to take them, I got to take them now. You know, there's a whole bunch of – or if it's really loose, you could actually risk it, you know, and go, I'm going to hit this – I'm going to make my stack now instead of next round because I know this guy's going to be taken 15, 20 spots down. Yeah. Uh, quick question from John. What's the VPIP equivalent of draft games? That's going to be the value hound ratio, right? I, don't, I, I would say standard deviation. There's no like okay. direct VPIP doesn't get VPIP would be <laughs> uh, total drafts really. But we like, well, I think, I think the live a little stuff, like how much are you just ignoring ADP and kind of drafting whoever you want uh, versus that's standard deviation. It? Yeah. I think that then, well, what, then what's the value with, hound ratio, the standard deviation with value hound ratio. So yeah. if you have a high standard deviation and your, and your value ratio is below 50, right? So above 50 means you're taking you're taking value all the time, right? Above yeah. 60, you're taking value all the time. And below, and also you might be auto drafting, right? Mm-hmm. So you might have you might like notice more auto drafters if their value hound ratio is high. So if you have a low value hound ratio and a high standard deviation, this guy's this guy's way off the board. Yeah. Yeah. Paul says, how relevant do you think last year's data is to how people are drafting this year? 
I bet it's pretty directionally accurate, but you know, in the same way in poker, right? Where they have the different things like he's tight, aggressive, he's loose, aggressive. Like it's going to be directionally accurate probably in that way. I would find it hard to believe that people just like completely alter their overall style. Um, but I guess to that point, when you show total drafts here or this data set, is this going to be unique to a specific contest or across all of their drafts? Right now it's just BBM four. Right. Well, it'll just be for BBM four and BBM like uh, those kind of BBM four ish drafts. You know the twelve. And yes. I don't know if we want to combine battle royale. Do we? Um, it's pretty different. The data would get all thrown off. I guess you could have a few things like standard deviation stuff that could actually go across. But I think this kind of stuff, like average QB pick, like the data is so different with six versus eighteen rounds. Right. So that my thought is. We'll just wait till they have more BBM for like if they do it every month and then we'll just keep adding it. Mm -hmm. And then maybe that'll need, maybe that'll be a new column like this year. And then overall, yeah. since the sample size is kind of small and then BBM and then battle Royale will have to be its own. So like when you go to a battle Royale one, it'll be, it'll have whatever their stats are for battle Royale. So then the other question is, is there, um, and apologies if you already said this, uh, is there like a comment field where you could leave notes? Oh my God. I didn't even think of that. Do you think people really want that? Well, I know sacrilegious has his own document where he keeps track of, uh, builds out his own profiles and stuff, but it's like, that might actually be even additionally valuable where it's like, I'm I, it, there's, there's a couple guys who are already legends in like the ship chasing and the bad pros channel for how they draft. And people talk like, Hey, you're in a draft with this guy. Watch out. He's taken four QBs late. Like people are already naturally doing that. So it could be a fun thing if it, it's easy. Maybe, to maybe we should, maybe we should. What, what that happened with poker with me, all it was when I go back and look at it's like, fish, what a fish. fucking donkey. This guy's the luckiest guy on the planet. Every comment. And I just stopped <laughs> using it. Yeah, no, that that could certainly happen. It, you know, it'd be up to the user how they want to use that that instrument. It could just be a venting tool where you just say, "I hate this fucking guy." <laughs> what do you think about this? I just took a screenshot of your um, of your uh, percent drafted, uh, you know, ADP equivalent that yeah. you just showed. Uh, what about adding that on the right here after you know after all the stats, so you could kind of like just remember, oh, that's right, right around. 16 is where these percentages drop off. What do you think that's over? Where, where would that display? Just to the right. We just expand this and then put a little matrix of, of your stats. But would it be but the, the stats you're describing or just the macro stats for everyone, not individual be, to this user? It would be literally a, st a static matrix yeah. of what you have in your video. Right. I think that would actually play better – Kind of like, you know where you put the Leone value buckets? Yeah. When we did that. I think that would make more sense in like that okay. area of the board and not okay. when you click a user. Right. And that's also still on there, obviously. So the as you draft your your value buckets uh, change, if people don't know what that is the in the Leone, Leone manifesto. And the auto drafter is based off those buckets too. So yeah. Yeah. Um, Sweet. Yeah, that's so. That's uh, I mean, we'll take. Uh, I'll take. Uh, it's going to be beta, right? So uh, if people want things adjusted or the look of it, you know, just yeah, say it in the Discord or send it to me, and we'll we'll update it. But I don't know. I think I think it's pretty cool. Like that's the whole fun yeah. point of best ball, right? Is you're you're there live trying to figure out what the other people are going to do. Well, I think it's a I think it's a fun thing too because. I mean, there's the element of, well, you think about it this way, you know, one thing that's really helped DFS grow and that's a fun and very useful exercise is you review top drafters lineups and you see what they're doing. You see like they had X percent of this guy in this slate and it tells you about how they think about a play or a style or how they want to approach a slate. I think building that out it's, it's good and fun for the ecosystem too. It can be helpful, but it also allows you to, to learn from those, from those drafters. Um, and you can apply it on a micro level, like, Hey, this guy at the turn. But I also think it's interesting just to know, like, what are the top drafters doing? How can I learn from that? Definitely. Yeah. And so you yeah. can like, just, that's why I put the average of the top 150 in there too, is so you can be like, Oh my God, I'm nitty, <laughs> you know, or, Oh my God, I'm like, way over and we don't we don't the average by the way you know this is still early in the we're still so early 
you know, in best ball, the average might not be right. And the guys who are more loose might be right. A lot of the good players, it appears to be loose. They appear to be pretty loose. And yeah. so um, you could, but you could see that on my site too, if you want to go to the individual ones. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, exactly. So like you could look, you could go over yours and compare and be like, uh, I need to, I mean, cause that's what Davis is going to do. Yeah. He's going to, he's going to, I, I, I'm holding my breath. I don't know if he can actually bring himself to go and down scrolling down, you know, 10, 15 every time or, or so. So we'll, we'll see. But, um, you know, another thing somebody said like about, um, I can't remember how they paraphrased it, but like, Oh, does it matter now that, you know, you have last year's data? Does it, is it really predictive or something? Was it you or Davis told me that someone did a study on the week 17 correlation stuff and like under 10% of people were correlating for week 17. But in our little world, it seems like everyone's doing it. Right. So like, I'm, I'm going to say like, you know, I doubt people are going to be looking, you know, using the HUD and using these stats and adjusting their play. They're probably going to draft just like how they always draft the vast majority of them. Like they're not going to watch this. Yeah. Yes. And the, in the vast, and one of the things too, and I think Davis would admit this, this is one of the funny things about Davis being a low key knit is because I would actually have assumed otherwise that Davis has all these IKB takes all these players. He likes that the market's an idiot and he'd be scrolling down and clicking them at all of this. I think it speaks less to not having takes and more so the anchoring effect of those ADPs. And unless you are consciously pushing yourself out of that comfort zone and like drafting with purpose, which sounds so hilarious and, you know, overweight relative to, to uh, drafting, but I do think that's true. And casual drafters are going to feel the anchoring effect of that ADP far more than any one of us sickos who are talking about it to where like they cannot help themselves, but lean into their tendencies over and over again. Yeah. It's gotta be, it's gotta be that anchoring bias. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like how how does Davis, his whole job is talking about sports. <laughs> how does he not have takes? Uh, so like I said that on that podcast too, like he has to go with his takes and, and just draft them this year, you know, just, you know, and don't go crazy, but he should be more up in that, you know, uh, 11% range, I think. Yep. Um, 11 standard deviation. All right. Before we go breaking news last week, it was nerdy tenor buying a Lowell's pint glass. I just saw an email notification come through. Hopefully you don't mind the docs, but Neil Orfield now also is a proud owner of a Lowell's pint glass and some additional glasses. There is now a scroll the F down pint glass in the store. I got, I got some tweeting to do. I haven't even tweeted out the video. I might go full thread, bro, share some of those, uh, some charts. But, uh, if you guys want to be like Neil, if you want to be like nerdy tenor, some of the pillars, bastions of the space, you too need to order a Lulz bug. I just absolutely deleted a seltzer in it today, Brian, and it went down smooth. Wow. Yeah. It'll make you remember. It'll make you do bless. It'll make you dupe less. Um, all right. Catch us on uh, the podcast feed as well, although this was a, a visual episode, lots of various charts, graphs. So uh, if you are listening to the audio version, you can check us out on YouTube every Thursday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Twitch as well. We do simulcast to Twitch for the Twitch heads. Brian, anything else other than people keeping an eye out for this upcoming uh, update to the best ball app? Yeah. Yeah. And I can't remember what it was. I did. I, I remember ownership, of, MMA, something like that. Yeah. I think I'm amazed this week. I'll do ownership. Um, God damn. I can't remember. Yeah. Whatever. Hmm. Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> what was it? Yeah. I, I got nothing. All right. We, Brian will wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night. He will remember it and he'll run to his Twitter feed and share the plug. I'm sure. Thank you guys for hanging out with us in the chat go check out that video on the deposit kingdom channel i will uh, pin it in the comments so you guys can easily find it until next time stay safe out